Hello again. This Hello. Is, uh, where Timmy, Curtis, and Vania from uh, Esiparono, which literally means they talk. The what? What? What does it mean? So uh, Esiparono means they talk. And they it's talk. A radio broadcasting show okay. about cinema. From they leave the Joe mm -hmm. Capitas movie. Well, um. Dammi un secondo. Okay. So. We just introduced um, ourselves. I, I want to make sure uh, one thing in uh, one uh, biography published on a um, 15 year old uh, magazine. I read that um, you studied for a while theology, right? Uh, no, religion. Uh, what I studied was comparative Compar religions, okay. it's phenomenology. Okay, it's, so the, it's the mythology behind all religions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the first question I would like to make is how this background, uh, you came from a Catholic uh, um, background, right? How um, this background uh, um, of studies uh, influenced in uh, some way um, your work and as a director and a screenwriter, and eventually your decision to uh, dedicate yourself uh, to making movies? Well, I think the best horror movies are ones that are based on Catholic mythology. <laughs> That's the best horror. Some when you see, well, I think whenever you, you have a, a vampire, yeah. you go to vampires in Asia, in China, in Japan, they're not very interesting. The rules are very vague. But in the West, in Europe, the vampire, the cross, the holy water, it's very clear, works very well. And I think body transformations, hey, you can't do better than the Catholic Church. It's, I can go to St. Peter's and see a marble sculpture, of, a horror sculpture of a saint with, holding his skin. It's, this is horror. This is Hellraiser. Saint so, Catherine without her eyes, or huh? many, many others. Saint Catherine, the, those. Are yeah. The, so I think there's a, and and and, you know, uh, Christianity is based on the transformation of the flesh. You know, it, it, it's all of the it, it it the flesh is super important. Well, actually, even in uh, the Christ history, we read that his disciples drank his blood. So. Yeah, eat his body and blood. This is cannibalism. Yeah. But, the, but also, I think when you see a great depiction of a, of a Catholic story, like the Passion of Christ yeah. movie, that's a horror movie. It's a great horror movie. I loved it. And, but, and yet it's a kind of a very traditional Catholic story. So I think that there certainly, I think anybody would be, you're always influenced by your past. So I certainly... Am, in, am influenced by that. Yesterday you said that uh, the social and political topics in uh, society were um, um, came after um, the starting of you know the pre-productions. Well, actually, a need they were necessary to find uh, um, a connection between the development of the story and the final massacre. But in past interviews, you said that uh, the screenwriter, Rick Fry, uh, was actually born and raised in a uh, Borghese high society in, in LA. Way. And that um, made him develop some sort of uh, paranoid tendencies. So he put his uh, rejection about high society in the writing of the film. Yeah, I would, it wasn't Rick Fry, it's Woody Keith. Woody Keith. Sorry. Woody Keith was brought up in Beverly Hills, very rich family, and, I th and he used this experience to create this paranoid script. The, the politics are intrinsic in it. They're implicit, but they weren't explicit in the original script. Also, there was no fantastic element. There was no shunting. It was nothing like that. So that's things that I, I brought to it and developed with the writers and the effects artist. And I wanted something fantastic. And I also wanted, um, I saw that already you're dealing with class. And so I used my own, life, my own experience of, um, being in the streets in the 60s and politics was fun. And I thought, well, this will be kind of unique to make a mythology, a kind of a monster mythology based on class. 
And so, but the, it's, it was, it was implicit in the script. It's just that I brought it out, I developed it further. Uh, the same thing goes for the, um, for the incest in the script. I tried to bring it out further. But I think that's what any, any director or any, you know, anybody does whenever you take something that already exists. You, you don't throw it away and get something new. You try to find what it is about it that you like and what it is that it makes possible. And I think that their script made possible for me to, to do some things I wanted to do without, without going against what they did. And I think what Woody Keith really did was he had this ironic, almost satirical view of these characters in society. It was, and of course, I, he's drawing it on his own experience. It's not true, but we all do that. We, we take characters that we have in our lives and then make them, you know, make them something that, that is, use them to make our own characters. Since we mentioned the final massacre in society and the concept of doing what you feel and you want to do, um, your longtime uh, collaborator, uh, Screaming Matt George, once said that he wasn't interested in uh, realism in developing special effects, but uh, he wanted to focus on the expressive value and the visionary effect despite realism. With modern technology, in your opinion, um, these two kinds of approach, how do they work? It is still possible to try to pursue um, like that approach, tomorrow, maybe. You mean what modern technology? You mean CGI? CGI. You mean CGI yeah, as opposed to rubber effects? Yeah, yeah. And modern, couple, modern uh, even uh, people tastes. It, mm -hmm. it is still possible to bring something like Reanimator and um, Society and, and other films to the crowd, the audience. Yes, I think it is. I think that, I mean, George is a, is a He's first an artist, then he did effects. He's not an effects guy who developed his art through making effects for movies. He just does art, he makes art, and he has his own interests. His interest is surrealism. I also am, have always liked surrealism, and that's where we, that's where we came together. Uh, I'll give you an example. Before I met George, I, may, I produced a movie called From Beyond. And the original poster for From Beyond was I took from a Dali painting of a skull with the skull in the eyes and the mouth. I forget the name of it. But I, I took that painting and asked the, the artist to make a version of that for for um, Pretorius in From Beyond as the po and the first poster that was made, the first key art was that. Now it evolved into more of a, you know, into a different one, but that was already a surrealistic image that I thought would work for From Beyond. When I met George to make Society, I had decided if, we ha if I hadn't wanted something fantastic, then the effects of society could be done with anyone who can do a throat cut or a hand cut off or something like this. It's very basic, basic effects. Puppets, yeah. And, um, but I wanted something fantastical and the image I had was of flesh melding together, which is surrealistic. And George, I, I was introduced to George because the film was being financed by Japanese money. And George is Japanese. And so they said, hey, would you meet this Japanese effects artist? Maybe that would be good for us. Well, when I met him, the first thing we did is watched Andalusian Dog, <laughs> looked through, looked at his paintings, looked at through his, his book, 
the, the book, the Dali books he had, and we chose images to use to, to develop the idea of the shunting. So it was definitely a, uh, definitely it's not realism. We would, we, George and I, when we would come up with the images, we called it psychofiction. It was making, making paranoia real, making ideas real in a, in a uh, expressionistic or surrealistic way. So for example, you can see it in the style of the movie. The very first scene, the boy bites into an apple. He's saying, I think the world, if you get underneath it, something terrible is there. And he bites an apple. Well, there's a worm in the apple. So the apple looks nice, but if you bite it, you see it's rotten. That's obviously a metaphor for the movie. But when he bites it, he doesn't see a worm. He sees 50 worms. <laughs> totally cuckoo. This is ridiculous, of course. This can't, it's, it's nutty. It's totally not realistic. But that's the stuff. When you see it in the movie, you go, oh, this movie is like that. It's not, if you made a more serious movie, it would just be that the, that the apple is rotten. But that, wouldn't be, but that wouldn't be a fun genre movie. It wouldn't tell you this movie is going to be more excessive than that. Talking about the mood and the vibe of the movie, um, as you said, uh, my pals um, wanted to do uh, a question about his, um, it's, um, you know, kind of like Beverly Hills, Falcon Crest feel in the first part. Um, and then shocking. Then derailing over. into the surrealistic, uh, you know, ending. Was uh, was the, that effect wanted? It, it it looks like a twisted parody of Beverly Hills and uh, you know plastic television stuff from the 80s. Was the effect wanted? Yeah. Well, it's the story is told as a the style of the movie at the beginning is a is a teenage comedy, right? It's like. The, the, the scenes at the locker, the girlfriend who's upset, the, going to the beach. The, I mean, this is, the, this, is a, this is a high school hijinks kind of movie, but it has a paranoiac element. And I think the movie, of course, early on when he touches his sister's back. Yeah, there are some suggestions. Yeah, I mean, that's, you get the feeling up. Oh, There's going to be something weird in this movie, but it could be that he's just cuckoo. But where the movie really changes is when his friend brings him the, the audio tape yeah. of the shunting of his parents. And it's when you hear that, you go, I don't know about this movie. Because <laughs> it's not just him, his friend has it. And so... I think that's when the movie start. You start going, "Oh, this is very uncomfortable. It's sexual with the family. They are, they do seem to be making fun of him." I think that's the moment for me when the movie becomes when I feel like I'm in. I, I want to know what's going to happen, and of course, then when he sees the psychiatrist and it's something else, you. I think it, it's creating a situ part. it's creating a situation that's impossible. How, how could this be? This couldn't be real. But then, of course, you know it yeah, is, it and that's <laughs> and that's the fun of it. It's yeah. it's a sucker punch of a movie. Even things like when you see the slug that the gardener has, yeah. it's huge slug on the screen with the sound of an elephant. <laughs> What? I mean, that's not real, <laughs> but it's a metaphor, you know, you kind of go, oh, this movie is kind of, you know, how slugs, when they, you know, slugs are hermaphroditic, and when they have sex, they all just pile on one, one another, and they actually rip through the skin yeah. of the one to, mouth. so you, and then they're eating slugs, and when they get pulled inside out, there's just slugs inside, but in the in the mythology of the movie i tried to create a complete mythology that actually a kind of slug in the 
early humanity in caveman times got into some people, came up from the earth and is like a parasite and uses the form of the people, almost like a thing or something. Yeah. And um, those people then were able to dominate the other people. So this is a, this is a kind of a cartoonish way of, of, of giving power. shape to the idea that some people have the ability to dominate other people strictly for their own narcissistic pleasure. And those people then intermarry. And they create actually almost a separate, a separate um, strain. strain of humanity. And they, so it's, the, it's literally blue bloods. It's the aristocratic class. And as they intermarry, their gene pool of the host of the, of the people form becomes weaker and weaker because there's no dynamism to the yeah, gene yeah, form pool. Yeah, most locks, they're, they are parasites. Yeah, and they're parasites on the other, on the humanity. And so we don't think of an aristocratic class as being, because this is a, this is a cartoon version of real, of a certain, of say class exploitation, which makes it sound very kind of academic, but that's not the intention. It's just using some model. It has to be about something. And so we don't think of, of, Aristoc aristocracy as being a predator of the serfs or the, the, the proletariat or the lump and masses. We think of them as being a parasite, not a predator. They're not hunting down. Yeah, no, they're like, just parasitically living so off yeah. of the lives of others. So this is a version. This is a a version of that, but in a comic book kind of format. If you, if you, if, and the shunting is so that they can get a better gene pool. Just like when you, when you breed dogs, you can't just have purebred dogs. They start having problems because the gene, they'll get hip dysplasia. Or things, things won't be right because it's like, that's why, we, that's why incest is a, is a taboo. Not because there's something intrinsically um, wrong about having well, sex with your mother or your sister or your daughter or something. <laughs> it's that if you do that, it's not good for survival of the race because the gene pool is too small. And so in aristocracies, we know this from history, you always end up with the king that's an idiot. You end up with the idiots. They, they intermarry too closely, and the whole aristocracy becomes Power weak. Well, they become weak, and they become not dynamic, and then that's not good for society, and so then you have to overthrow them. In the movie society, they need Billy, and they need the bastards, the nobodies, the... To improve, to improve they, they assimilate them, and, um, and that's how they keep their vigor. So it's a, you know, it's, I even hesitate to say it's a metaphor, because that also sounds very kind of academic and everything. But it's, let's say it rhymes. I, I think a good example of this is that, is that, take the idea, here's the classic horror idea of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, we know that this idea is um, the idea that you could, you know, that people can have an id. You can have a dark side. That you can give in to the dark side and, and be a, a drunk and a rapist and a, a, a cannibal. Yeah, whatever. whatever, you know. And so you, and, and in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, it gives form to that idea in a science fiction way. He takes a drug that makes him express his dark side. Well, that's not really a lot different than what happens when you take drugs. You know, smoke some, some cocaine or some methamphetamine and then 
see how you act. You guys don't say that You'll be sure. acting a little bit like Doc, Mr. Hyde. You can be Dr. Jekyll. You start getting strung out on methamphetamine, you'll see some very kind of terrible behavior. So that's not something that's unreal, but I don't want to see a movie about somebody just becoming a drug addict. We have them. I don't find it to be much fun. But when you put it into a sci-fi horror context and tell the story in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, now I'm interested. That fictionalization, that's, that's, that synthetic aspect of storytelling, it seems more true to me than trying to represent real terrible things in the world. Now take Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the book, he just changed how he, how he stood, how he moved, how he took care of himself. Any one of us can do this. If you see me like this, behaving well, I seem like a respectable person. If I'm starting to get dark and act weird and acting kind of dangerous or indulgent, I don't have to change how I look, but I maybe I'm not combing my hair now, I'm not shaving, I'm I'm not bathing, I you know, I'm not dressing well, I don't, you know, I wear old clothes. Well, that's, that's real. But in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, that's what ha he just becomes like that. Same clothes, same everything. So if you take that another step, then in the, in the 20s, um, John Barrymore played that part, and he did the whole transformation on camera. But he'd put makeup on. He was going like this. He'd go down to, under the table, put some makeup, make it dark under his eyes. But then later, we want to see a transformation. We use the technology to make like a wolfman transformation. And then you end up with, I mean, the wolfman is Jekyll Hyde, right? When the moon comes, he changes. But the reality of it is, is people do change, but in genre, what we like to do is make that entertainment and make it kind of symbolic, and then it seems much more fun. It's like, it's well, like you can get in a car and drive 120 kilometers an hour in a narrow mountain road and be in danger of hitting somebody or falling off, and it's scary. You have vertigo. You it's dangerous and thrilling. So that's not so great, but if you go to a theme park and go on a roller coaster, you can get that same feeling in a context that's fun. And I think genre movies tend to take things and make, put them in the, in the theme Exciting. park kind of idea of fun and make them more accessible and kind of, it simplifies them a lot. So I think this is the, you know, this is the whole idea of, of genre and telling things in a, in a certain style. And I think that's why we like horror and why we like genre movies, because it takes these, takes things and gives them kind of a symbolic, a surrealistic, uh, expressionistic form that in some ways feels more real than realism. We are nearly out of time. But what do you remember about your experience with Disney? Honey, I shrunk the kids. Well, I think that when I, um, after Stuart and I were making horror movies, one time we, Stuart said that we should make a film for our kids because we both have children. I have four kids, he's got three kids. We're family men. And we think, oh, we got little kids. Reanimator okay. from beyond. <laughs> we said, let's you make a movie for kids. <laughs> yeah, well, let's make a movie for, for our kids. And I said, well, when I was a kid, I always imagined I'd lie down in the grass and I'd imagine being real small in the grass and the roots of the trees, where the dirt would be an adventure. It was so big. And I imagined, oh, you could ride on a bee or on an ant or a beetle. And it Most just seemed like a fantastic idea. 
And then Stuart said, yeah, yeah, the, the father is a scientist and he shrinks them and they get thrown out in the backyard and have to get home. Oh, that's a good story. And we quickly started coming up with ideas. In fact, we wrote the whole story on an Alitalia flight from Rome to Los Angeles in 1986. We were working in Rome. Wasn't and we had also. a <laughs> and Stuart and when we were thinking the story the first time, Stuart said it should be a Disney movie and we should put Fred McMurray in it, because we used to like those old, old movies. <laughs> and so he had a good agent and he got us a, a meeting at Disney. And on the and we were flying back for the meeting. And on the flight, we went to the back of the plane. Stuart took out a big yellow pad, and we said, okay, let's write the story. Boop, 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 boop. During the flight, we wrote the story, and then we went and pitched it to Disney, and boom, 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 all of a sudden, we're making the movie. Thanks a lot. Thank you.